Where the year ended? What? The year ended. Where is it? The fuck are you talking about? You're talking about music before. You're now forced to make a year ended. The, that, that, that can't possibly be right. I'm not forced to do anything. Nope, I got the contract right here. So 2020 is finally over, but if there's anything that I've learned from these post-2016 times, it's, uh, that, that it's just only gonna get worse. But, because I'm obliged to do a year-end list, apparently, because I talked about music just like 11 times, uh, let's just talk about the better side of 2020. And while that wasn't constantly frequent, there were actually, you know, a, a surprise amount of songs that I actually really liked this year. In fact, what makes this list majorly different from any other list I would have done, like, any other year, is just the fact of how many different artists there are. Some of these artists I never even heard until, like, this year, and, that, and that's all because of my Songs of the Month series that I did a while back. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into this list, starting with... Number 10. Losing my religion. So, 2020 was a pretty hard year. Every single month, it seemed like one new thing was happening, and it was worse than the last new thing that happened, to the point that the title of Hellworld is an understatement. But the biggest thing was this goddamn pandemic. And many artists came out with music about it, myself included, but I think these guys did the best. Don't give up Shinedown is a band that I have loved ever since I heard Sound of Madness appearing in most Harry Potter character theme song videos back in, like, 2015. God, remember when that was a thing? <laughs> and after hearing all their music, I came to the conclusion that their 2012 album, Amaryllis, was their second best album of all time, with Brent just pouring his heart out from the pain he went through. And like most artists, I prefer their older music over the newer stuff. The newer stuff isn't bad, I still enjoy them, but... Sound of Madness and Amaryllis will forever be classics to me. And then this pandemic started and Shinedown came out with a song that was written back during the Amaryllis days and released it on the 8th year anniversary of that album. And my god did I severely underrate this song. My initial thoughts on the song was that it was good, but nothing too special. And then I heard it more, and that chorus just constantly gave me chills, and it was slowly making me realize that nothing about the song was inherently about the pandemic, and it was more of an actual fitting track for that album, giving me kind of the same vibes as Unity or I'll Follow You. But because music is so great, you can hear these lyrics and they reflect on the current hell state the world's been in, and that's honestly what made me love this song a lot more. Not only was Shinedown able to take an old song and give it their new flair while making it work, but they were also able to take a song that really doesn't mean much and turn it into a completely different thing all by changing the timing of the release. And I think that's fucking amazing. Number 9 Help me. This year was a complete tonal shift for me music-wise. For one, I started getting more into the scene emo punk music, and also given a time this year where I started truly having feelings for someone again, I started getting more into love songs, and more specifically, being in love with someone that doesn't love you back. And then this band just decided to combine those two things. Where are you tonight? I can get you out of my Silverstein is a very hit or miss band for me. I got Infinite in a Spotify playlist and I thought it was pretty dope, but the rest of their stuff, to be honest, just never really resonated with me. And then they made this song. The lyrics speaking about being in love with someone, but that person just doesn't exist or you haven't met them yet 
really resonated with me, and the more calm, slow-paced delivery with the song, both musically and delivery-wise, is why I specifically like the alternate version more than the original. The original just sounded like it had too much going on and didn't know what it was wanting to be, and let's be honest, it just failed the vibe check. The alternate version, though, past the vibe check with that really nice acoustic guitar and later during the bridge the warm roads that just ooh, they sound so good the whole song sounds like when you lay in your room at midnight in your feels and i absolutely love it for that every second is a lifetime. number eight creepy anime video most things related to anime are meant to be cute or at the very least sexual. You remember how I said that I was kind of getting into the scene kid music? Well, a lot of scene kid music is from MySpace. And a lot of MySpace songs are absolutely fucking garbage. Until you decide to make a metalcore cover of one of them. God, I fucking love this song. Captain Graveyard was able to take what is let's be honest, cringy lyrics, and make them sound so fucking good, and it's all thanks to how hard this song hits. The guitars are just in your face and pumping the song along with the drums, and that synth line just goes fucking insane, and oh my fucking god, that breakdown towards the end of the song. I've also grown really tired of growls because it feels like every band is doing them nowadays, but this song knew how to use them right and just more as a emphasis for certain parts that it makes them so goddamn enjoyable. I can't make it five seconds through the original, especially during the drop, but this song I can hear on repeat 20, 30, 40, 50 times without once losing any love for it. Also, shout out Captain Graveyard for commenting on my Songs of the Month video where I talked about this one. Number 7, Ghost Girl Head. Now, throughout the past year of trying to find new music, I've come across this trend in metal bands where uh, they bring absolutely no new sound and ends up sounding like every other fucking song I've ever heard. I'm also in a Discord server that does a listening party once a month, and almost every time we end up getting suggestions of metal songs that, to me, just all sound the same. That was until the September listening party where this played. Now, the first thing I thought when I heard this was, this sounds like Rammstein. And that would be a problem if all I heard was Rammstein, but instead the lead singer Johnny brings in a voice that sounds a bit like Till Litterman, but also a bit unique. And then the chorus comes in and sounds nothing like Rammstein, then you get to the bridge that sounds like nothing I've heard before. All while this song sounds neat and tidy and not like a complete mess. And it fucking hits hard! <laughs> Oh my god, the last time I've headbanged so hard to a song that my neck hurt the next day was when I heard, like, In This Moment's Comanche back in 2017. Or when I saw In This Moment live back in 2018. Needless to say, I am not one to do a lot of headbanging, but this song fucking demands it. Overall, this was another one of those songs that I just could not stop playing for days after I heard it. So, uh, to the person who added this one, thank you so much. Number six, do you wear thigh highs? 2020 was a pretty interesting year when it came to covers. I came across an artist who did a metal cover of a Hotline Miami song. Obviously, there was Captain Graveyard with their metalcore cover of a MySpace song. Five Finger Death Punch came out with an orchestral acoustic cover of one of their biggest hits. Motionless and White even released a cover of Somebody Told Me that sounded both early mid-2000s and modern. And even though it was released last year, in 2020, I heard a cover of Pumped Up Kicks that sounded like if Marilyn Manson was the lead singer for Nine Inch Nails. And now Never in my life did I think that combo would work with an 80s pop classic. When Three Teeth announced that they did a cover of You Spin Me Round, I thought it was a really interesting choice, but wouldn't be good. I thought it'd be fine at best, I just couldn't really see it working for them. And oh boy was I wrong. <laughs>
The lyrics work so perfectly with Lex's delivery, and given the band being in a completely different genre, you get the instrumental being, instead of 80s pop, industrial metal, and my god does it fucking hit. That chorus, oh my god, that chorus hits so fucking hard, and given the fact that this was made for Guns Akimbo, the whole song makes me imagine Daniel Radcliffe in a cyberpunky world just gunning down people, despite the movie from what I've heard not being that at all. <laughs> Speaking of Guns Akimbo, I've heard mostly negative reviews of that movie, but this song hits so goddamn hard that it makes me want to go watch the movie just so I could see the scene where this plays. Like I said back when the song accidentally got posted on Spotify, Three Teeth doesn't miss, and they sure as hell didn't with this one. Number five, don't leave me. Need I say any more? Five Finger Death Punch on the top ten list, let alone at number five. Yeah, that's pretty controversial, but when have I never had a controversial opinion? Five Finger Death Punch is a band that I have not hidden my love for, and even after some moments that were, ah, uh, pretty yikes to say the least, it still doesn't change the impact this band had on me back when I first heard A Hundred Ways to Hate. I've always felt like their music spoke to my angsty, angry preteen self, and when Injustice for None came out, I was just entering the anger stage of a breakup. Fast forward two years later, I'm losing a bit of my anger, but at the same time, I hate people, and I'm often in a bad mood, and Five Finger Death Punch just comes along with their eight studio album brings this song. A little bit off captures that vibe of just being in a mood where you don't want to talk to people and you don't want anybody talking to you, while also being something new to the band, and that's making lo-fi metal. And for some reason it works. On my first listen to the song, I wasn't a big fan, but by the second or third chorus, I, I was absolutely sold. And like usual, Ivan comes in with lyrics that are Probably really fucking edgy, but I'm really fucking edgy, so I relate. It's just a great song with a great vibe that perfectly captures the mood that my life's been uh, transitioning into now, and aside from all the bullshit the band's been doing lately, I couldn't thank them enough for shit like this. You can all fuck off today. Number four. Watching Barack Obama. Ever since 2018, there's been this increasing rise of women rappers, with a lot of them being really controversial, mostly with the fact that they rap about sex. And in 2020, the world was given a song all about sex and female empowerment. That apparently nobody wants to fucking pay any attention to! Being good, I'm a bad bitch. I'm sick of motherfuckers trying to tell me how- Megan the Stallion does sex rap right. You know why? Because she at least fucking brings punchlines. I swear to God, every sex rap song I've heard has just been the most generic I got good pussy or I got good dick message. And it's like, I don't give a fuck. Oh, you're good at something. Cool. C can you at least bring some fucking entertainment to it? And that's what Megan does. For fuck's sake, she came on here referencing anime. And even though it's Naruto and I have an immense hatred for Naruto, it's still an anime reference. And what makes everything else about this so great is that it's done on the boys in the hood beat. The fucking balls to go on such an iconic and classic beat is immense. And Megan does not disappoint. Like I said, she comes on here referencing anime, but at the same time, she comes in with this like, bad bitch, you can't fuck with me vibe that I, a white man, feel so goddamn confident listening to it. Just look at this shit. Look at all these bars. Why is nobody talking about this? I'm gonna be honest, it genuinely upsets me that everyone was so focused on WAP because that song was fucking trash with Megan being the only good part about it. And I really wish that this song would have gotten that recognition. So yeah, fuck WAP. Stream Girls in the Hood for clear confidence. Just mad, mad. They wanna hurt me. Ah. Number three, I don't like you. How do I explain this next song? <laughs> Fuck it. Modern day kills really must take fun. More often people taking lives like a knife and guns to be a murder. Yeah, I fell down the rabbit hole. 
I've made it pretty obvious that ever since I saw 2011 Hunter Hunter last year that, uh, I've been slowly descending into becoming a weeb. So much so that on my fucking album, I made a song called Up and Coming Weeb. And when doing that, you tend to at some point get into anti-tubers. Only for me it was kind of the opposite because I watched Trash Taste before any of the host's content. And as some of you may know, Trash Taste did an episode featuring a VTuber from Hollow Life English whose name is Mori Calliope. I'm gonna come right out and say it. I'm a simp. I believe in Cali supremacy. But yeah, that Trash Taste episode led me down the rabbit hole of VTubers, and I'm subscribed to three of the Hololife EN members. My whole recommended feed is just VTuber clips. I play that clip of Cali whispering in your ear to have a nice day. I have truly hit rock bottom. But one of the things that came out of me going down this hole was uh, Cali's music. And admittedly, it took some getting used to with a girl who sounds like she came straight out of an anime rapping that is only destined for cringe. But in less than a day, I got used to it and two songs stuck to me. Curse Nights, which was hella relatable, and this one. My fucking god, this is a banger that has no right being one. The production alone is just astonishing. Easily my favorite parts is that brass and the EDM synth during the final chorus. But the best part of the song, hands down, is Callie herself, because she deadass just said fuck it and switch into a different language mid-bar to make the punchline work along with the rhyme scheme and it sounds fucking incredible. And from my understanding, she's not a Japanese native, so speaking Japanese in a song when you're not native, it, it, it's kind of destined to fail, like nine times out of ten that's gonna fail, but it fucking didn't. In the slightest, never in my life have I heard someone rhyme Kenshi with Da Vinci and it fucking working. You take the incredible production and mix that with Callie's amazing skill with the writing and rapping and you got yourself an absolute banger that I have not been able to stop playing at all. Number two, Strange Behavior. Damn, remember when we went on quarantine back in like May? Yeah, well, around that time I decided to broaden my horizons in music, truly stop giving a fuck about genres and just listen to a ton of songs that either Spotify or friends recommend me and just overall expand my playlists. And I am so fucking glad I did. I need to know. I've talked about how much I love the song in the past, but when I first heard this, I could not stop listening to it. It was constantly stuck in my head, and it still does to this day. Everything about it, from the smooth guitar riff, to the lead singers yelling on the chorus, to that THICK bass line, I knew almost immediately that this was one of my favorite songs of 2020. Another thing about this song that makes it so interesting to me is their song Smile was the turning point into their new sound, but Need to Know is what solidified it for me, because the next two singles after that were basically Need to Know 2 and Need to Know 3, and I am completely fine with that. The style that Tropic Gold brought with this song and continue going forward with makes them one of those bands that could just release the same song over and over again, and they would all consistently hit. It's a sound and formula that sounds very much the same while also sounding unique with every rendition, and it's all thanks to the song. That Tropic Gold album. I need it! Now before we get to our number one spot, let's do some honorable mentions. I should also preface that in my eyes, I think December is a part of the new year, and I'm kind of stretching it with November, but there's a reason why. And if you don't like that, then too bad, this is my channel, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Alright, honorable mention time. Oh, well. Easily the best single from New Empire Volume 1, but unfortunately had the same curse that Whatever It Takes and California Dreaming had, where after a while, I just got sick of it. I can go back to it now and still enjoy it, but not as much as I used to. NF dropped his version of The Way I Am after dropping his second best album, and it is an absolute banger, but I also... <laughs> kind of forget it exists. Easily the best 
easily one of Eminem's best songs right next to Stan and Bad Guy, but it doesn't give me the same impact as those songs, and I just kind of find myself losing enjoyment after every listen. Not the biggest fan of a lot of Joji's music. Wasn't even a big fan of the Pink Guy stuff, but this song is an absolute vibing banger. And that insane guitar solo towards the end makes it all worth it. I tossed back and forth between putting this on the list because it's great and I love when it's playing, but... I also kind of forget it exists when it's not playing, but I put paid my dues on here, so this might as well be given the chance. Loving somebody while you don't know if you love them back and is also a vi- Oh, oh shit, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, my bad, wrong song. Here we go. Loving somebody while you don't know if you love them back and it's also a vibe. Also, Vocal Chops. I love Vocal Chops. For real, though, I, I do think Wish We Knew is, like, the best song I've released this year. <laughs> Solence's best song, with it giving me the lyrical topic of, a like, an old-school five-finger death punch song, and I absolutely love it. One thing, though, what the fuck was the release of this album? Why were six of the seven songs singles? Why? <laughs> I think I like this more than I like the original just because I like Chris's voice more than Brandon's. Both versions are great, but this one just brings more of a vibe that I enjoy. This shouldn't be put on the list because the EP had no singles, but god do I love it, so fuck you. You know, as a matter of fact, I am never blind. I never know. I am so fly. I never know. Young Scrolls consistently releases bangers, and this is no exception. This is easily one of my favorite beats from him and has some really funny bars. Only reason this ended up as an honorable mention is because of the Todd Howard feature, which I'm just not the biggest fan of. Decoders releases only bangers. Even the SoundCloud teasers are really good that I ended up using them as my background music, and this song isn't any exception. Deadass had this playing on repeat for like two, three hours when it was released, and almost immediately put it in my background music folder. Like That wasn't a single and Hate Me came out in September, so I have to resort to my third favorite song off the album. He's a banger, though. And... Finally, number one, Christmas Eve. In 2020, the world was blessed with an absolute trap banger that says, fuck bitches, fuck life, I'ma do whatever I want, while also spitting absolute bars. That's right, I am of course talking about... Got bitches posted on the wall like an elf on the shelf when I was 11 I turned 13 Song of the decade, my well. dudes. Song of yeah. the century. Ooh. Citrus Hands comes into the game with his debut single showing how much of a pimp he is and how much of a god of rap this dude is. But also opening up about his mental health saying that he isn't depressed anymore because the McRib is back. I'm kidding. I absolutely love that song, but uh... You know I had to put this one on here. Look, I know that this was technically released in November of last year, but I have two excuses. One, it was the 27th, so the late end of November, so practically December. And two, I'm late to the party, so fuck you. This song is such a goddamn mother fucking capital B-A-N-G-E-R BANGER! The production is easily one of my favorite beats from Metro Boomin, and maybe, maybe one of my favorite beats of all time. Ugh, that synth bait during the chorus is so nut-inducing. And the lyrics, what, what can I say about the lyrics? They embody trash behavior, and I love every bit of it. Especially when given the context of this album where he tries to do so much work to better himself after a relationship, and it just goes, fuck all that, I hate women. <laughs> That's gonna get taken out of context, isn't it? It's such garbage behavior, but he's able to make it sound so fucking good. And then you got lyrics like these. 
These are certified banger lyrics, okay? I don't want to hear it. Given the fact that this is the lone trap song in the album, The Weeknd and Metro Booming fucking delivered. They delivered with an absolute banger, and from the moment I first heard it, I knew it was the best song of 2020. Despite it coming out last year. <laughs> There, was that good enough for you? Well, you cut what do we do then? What, what do you, what, what, do you, what do you mean? You also had to talk about the albums. <sighs> Fuck! <sighs> okay, turns out I can't, I can't just make a top 10 singles list. I, I also have to do a top 10 albums list. The only problem is, is I, I, I didn't really listen to a lot of albums, and, and if I did, it, it was just kind of boring. So, I guess you're just gonna have to settle for a top 5. At least I got some honorable mentions that can make up for that. Nonetheless, let's just get into this, starting with... Number 5. Don't leave me. Have you ever listened to an artist where in the early days of their career they sounded really good, but eventually as time went on it seemed like the quality of their music slowly dropped and you're not really vibing with a lot of it. But then one day they come out with an album that goes back to that previous sound and vibe while mixing in a little bit of that new sound that they've been having. Yeah, me too. Call me what you want, but never call me finished, nigga. I'm just getting started with my shit to start beginning. I'm in this I found Khan back in April of 2018 when I found his remix of Rap God and ended up going down the rabbit hole of listening to all of his SoundCloud shit. Antidope. Feels, FF at all, Blasphemy, Mary Jane, Mask Off, Needs and Wants, Rap God, Shit, The Eagles, Untouchables, Void, Passing Me By, Time, Shout Out to Gucci, Bangers, all of them. And then when it came to the albums, I listened to Heart Shape Melody and overall I liked it, and then Pure Attentions, which I wasn't really a big fan of. Then I was just kind of out of it for a lot of his releases until Naivete, where I still just wasn't feeling it. And then All Praises Do released, which... If I remember correctly, it was the opening track forward that got put in my release radar, and I immediately just heard that SoundCloud flow. Throw that on top of the smooth and lush production that Big O's brought, and I was just loving the absolute hell out of the track. So then one day, while I was having an epic gamer session of Minecraft, I decided to throw on the album, and my god, this man does not miss. So much of this album is just banger material. You get this fast SoundCloud flow on tracks like Manifesto, Celesty, Flight, Apparition, or during the verses on Forward, or the hook of Elevation, $100,000 in the Benz. And that's not even mentioning the godly production by Big Ghost all throughout this album. Most of it are these calm, ambient beats that just establish the vibe that this thing brings. But then you get cases like the soulful outro sounding track on The Feeling, which is only the third fucking track. Or the slow but banger material on $100,000 in the Benz. And then there's just everything about apparitions from the beat and the hook bringing out so much goddamn nostalgia and some of Khan's delivery really helped with that nostalgic vibe sounding exactly the way he used to back on some of those old SoundCloud songs that it just takes me back. And of course, because it's Khan, there are a couple bars on here that get a laugh out of me. This thing is just a beast that doesn't overstay its welcome with it only being 10 tracks and 30 minutes long and is Khan easily at his best in a while and I am so happy for it. Number 4 Watching Barack Obama. If you've seen my content before, you would know that I make music myself, and as one of the things I'm very proud of with my music is the fact that I was able to craft my own sound and genre bending. Not saying that I created genre bending, but saying that I was able to go into that genre itself and create my own sound from it, with some of my songs blending up to like three, four, sometimes even five different genres at once, and I feel like I pulled it off pretty well with my last album. Because of this, I am a bit defensive over the term genre bending because while I make music in that realm, I also like listening to it as well. And when artists are out in interviews saying that they're so great at genre bending, yet all they do is blend pop and trap, the two most basic genres that are practically the same at this point, I get a little upset. Thankfully, 2020 gave us a mainstream album that does genre bending so goddamn well. Now, I've already done a fully in-depth track-by-track review of this album, and if you've seen that, then 
It really shouldn't be a surprise that I would have this album on the list. Oliver Tree crafted such a great genre-bending album with the songs going through rock, pop rock, synthwave, trap, hop, and a little bit of orchestral music thrown in there. And one thing I have to give this album a lot of credit for is that multiple times it just switches to a completely different genre in the same song without sounding awkward or jarring, but instead being really smooth and natural. And like I said in my review, sonically this album sounds so fucking amazing. The acoustic guitars on Cash Machine, Let Me Down, Miracle Man, and Waste My Time are EQ'd in a way where they're so teeny but at the same time really warm and just sound so good in my ears. The tone on the electric guitars in Me, Myself, and I and Jerk are more hard rock focused and then on Introspective and I'm Gone it's more clean sounding but they still sound amazing. Then you get songs like 1993 which have these really dark and grimy synths with an insane bass or on Alien Boy where the production re flex the song topic with the lyrics being about being a weirdo and the beat just being filled with all these little kind of weird sounds and percussion and speaking about i'm gone earlier that shit is one of the best outro songs i have ever heard on an album oliver ends this project with what genuinely sounds like the end credit theme for a movie which is perfect given how this is the first and last album from him this whole thing is just amazing for my genre bending loving ears and even though there's some songs that i just don't think hit as hard or i feel are kind of weird on the album this whole thing is mostly just hits and i'm so glad it exists Number three, I don't like you. This shouldn't be a surprise at all. I'm pretty well known for being a massive fan of this band and being one that gives them mostly positive reviews. I still to this day defend Got Your Six and Injustice For None despite those albums being at the bottom of my ranking just because this band rarely releases a bad song for me. And when it comes to defending albums, Fate is no exception. The lead up to this album had the band saying that they were going to be doing something a bit different, even saying that they were going back to their roots and Ivan saying that he wanted to improve after the last two albums. And I wholeheartedly think they succeeded, especially when Inside Out released and started off with a fucking orchestral intro. The last time they did orchestra stuff was like... Far From Home or Cold, but it was just background strings. Meanwhile, on this album, you get bits where it sounds like an entire symphony featured on a song, like on the aforementioned Inside Out intro, which is actually just the title track, which is just... One of my biggest complaints. It's fucking stupid, but but nonetheless. It's also found on songs like Darkness Settles In or Brighter Side of Grey. Lyrically, I think Ivan improves a lot on here and brings in more topics. Yeah, you could blatantly ignore 90% of the album and focus on songs like This Is War to prove your point of Ivan doesn't change, but that's literally wrong when you get songs like Inside Out, which is about his alcohol abuse, while also sounding like a breakup song. A little bit off, capturing that vibe of just being in that mood of just don't talk to me. Bottom of the top, having him being done with all all the shit the band gets put through by critics and saying he just wanted to be looked up as an idol and just he wanted to make music like the bands that he enjoys Pr pretty much just being his version of the way i am to be alone sounds like that old school sarcastic fuck you vibe that made me fall in love with this band and genuinely sounds like their version of bully or enemies by shinedown Yet another band that I love, Scar Tissue goes back to that breakup song vibe and doing it so well and better than they have done in a while. Brighter Side of Grey literally sounds like Ivan's suicide note. And you even get the song Death Points Therapy, which is basically just them referring to a bunch of their past songs in a way that I absolutely love. I know it's not for everyone, but I fucking love references, so I love this song. But then speaking sonically again, you get A Little Bit Off, which features the band pulling off Metal Lo-Fi or Darkness Settles In and Brighter Side of Grey being more subtle and ballad-esque while also combining the metal sound. Scar Tissue features Chris Kale going off and it's so goddamn great. Hell, I wasn't even the biggest fan of Making Monsters when it came out, but it has grown on me a lot, sounding the most uncut and raw they have in a while. I saw a review where a dude said that Making Monsters was his favorite track because of how raw and unradio friendly it sounds, which is why it ended up becoming a bonus track. And I can't disagree with him. Dude was spitting straight facts. This album isn't perfect though. Mother May I, This Is War, and Living the Dream are easily my least favorite songs. Especially Living the Dream. The music video doesn't help the song either. My god. Hey, I'm just gonna say. It could be worse. They could be trapped. I'll resign my card from the fanbase when Ivan says that fucking 
women fucking children is not pedophilia. But you can't seriously tell me that they did not bring something new this time around. Five Finger Death Punch came in with an album where they tried to go back to their old sound while also bringing in some new stuff they haven't done a lot of, and I think they pulled it off incredibly well. A Five Finger Death Punch album was gonna make it on my favorite albums list either way, but with how great about 95% of the album is, and just how much it made me reflect my current life, that really helped it to get to third place, even with the dislikes that I have towards it. If I'm being honest, I think Fate is actually, like the one Five Finger Death Punch album I have the most critiques about. But, you know, it's still better than the last two, if I'm being honest. Number two, Strange Behavior. I used to do a series on this channel this year called Songs of the Month. I eventually stopped doing that just because it was causing me to not be able to work on other projects I wanted to do. But besides that, in the first episode, I featured a certain song labeled after a certain physics term. And when talking about that song, I mentioned that the band who made it didn't have an album out. Well, it's out. This album is so good. This thing is just back-to-back -back bangers. The album literally starts off with my favorite song and ends off with my second favorite song. And almost everything in between is just as good. After the heavy banger that is like that, you get yet another heavy banger, which is... I'm gonna be honest, I don't know how to fucking pronounce that. <laughs> but anyway, that song features a vocal synth melody it's kind of weird but like at the same time your boy your boy love vocal chops your boy just loves vocals on like a lot of things so you know it's it's, it's good then there's blurry which manages to create the sound of blurriness evil Igo completely dishes the punk aesthetic in the beginning and instead brings this really weird vibe and then when it brings back the punk aesthetic it fucking hits and i absolutely love it wavelength is a banger we've already discussed this drink to drown hits way too close to home for me and is a rare song that features no drums and a slow piano that I can actually stand listening to without getting bored. Do What You Wanna brings back the banger material. Silk and Satin goes back to the weird vibe and it once again works. Soap goes back to the banger material. And then we end off the album with an incredibly strong note with the massive banger that is Hate Me. Seriously, Hate Me hits so goddamn hard, it has no right to. This whole album is literally just banger after banger, and the absolute charisma and personality that the lead singer brings with her vocals just helps it so much. I follow Bonnie on Twitter and Instagram, it's a fucking riot, I, I love it. I highly suggest, even if you don't like the band, just follow her on social media, You, she never, she never misses. There is only one song on this album that doesn't really hit for me, and that's Jurassic Park. It's not a bad song, it's just, I don't know, I don't really get anything from it. But god damn if this album doesn't immediately make up for that. I know the only thing I can say about this album is that it's just bangers, but that's basically what it is. I don't know how uh, problematic this next statement is gonna be. I'm kind of rolling the dice on this one, but listening to this album makes me forget what gender I am. I'm not gonna explain that solely because I don't know how to. I'm just gonna leave it at that. You try figuring out what that fucking means. There's not much else I can say about it other than it's just a fun listen all throughout. You should probably say to yourself. Now on to the honorable mentions. I Feel Nothing is pretty much the sole reason why this is on here. The rest of the EP is great, but that song alone is just a fucking mood and a half. I, I absolutely love it. Josh A then decided to follow up Grim Peaks with his own album, and for the most part, it's really great. That first verse and the opening track always hits hard. Like, it always gives me chills, even if I'm just reading the lyrics. And then you get songs like Gravestone, Scars, Mood Swings, Lost, and the title track, which really show Josh being incredibly personal. And then Warzone is just an absolute banger, but Jesus Christ, Josh, did you really have to include that goddamn knocking sound? That scared the living fucking shit out of me. Sadly, the album does kind of fall off, though, and gets a bit generic, especially with a song like Revenge, which feels so out of place on the album that I couldn't really in good faith put it along with the albums on this list, which are very strong all throughout. Nonetheless, this is the greatest Josh A album I've heard, though that's not saying much because I've only heard this and Fearless. Ooh, 
friends. It's not the end of your Mori. No, because every closed door is just the intro of a brand new story. Like I said, I fell down that goddamn rabbit hole, and I don't regret it, because it has given me the absolute banger of R.I.P., which is on this EP. Sadly... It outshines every other song on here to the point that they just don't hit as much. The title track is pretty dope with Callie giving that Sundere vibes and that hilarious ending. The outro track is probably the second best song in the EP for me, especially when she sings these lines. Sadly, I'm not really the biggest fan of the opening track. The B just really doesn't do it for me and her opening lines just make me cringe that it, it makes the rest of the song really hard to get through. But either way, it's still a dope EP and I look forward to what Kelly has in the store in the future. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, finally, the last album on the list. Number one, Christmas Eve. Do I even have to say anything? I, I mean, you've seen the best songs list, this is insanely obvious. Fun fact, I actually struggled to get through this album multiple times because of the opening track. It just just couldn't hit for me for so long and I couldn't get past it. But I owe my love for this album solely for D'Angelo Wallace's review, where he went track by track and explained the rough concept of this album, that it made me be able to get through the entire thing. And God, I am so glad it did. The Weeknd really out here making a concept album about going through a breakup, trying to be the better person throughout it, and then just delving back into being an absolute toxic piece of shit, and then just slap that onto some indie synths and made back-to-back -back bangers. Unlike the other albums on here, there is not a single song on After Hours that I don't like. I, I don't even know if I have any problems with this album. Alone Again, just comes in hitting like a truck. Too late just embodies the musical form of an orgasm at that 40 second mark. And God, the form is shifting. I'm a fucking nut. Hardest to Love is yet another 80s synthwave bop and is incredibly relatable. Then you go into Scared to Live, which spends majority of its runtime being just a nice, calm vibe before going into honestly one of Abel's greatest vocal performances on this album, in my opinion. I said Then that goes into Snow Child, which I think is the lone rap track on the album, with Abel going on about his past career and the relationship while having bars like... Stack a couple M's like I was shady. I'm an Eminem fan, uh, of course I'm gonna like that. Escape from LA is another vibe track, and we followed it up with the immense banger that is Heartless. Faith is a full-on 80s pop song, and I'm all for it, and so is the following track, Blinding Lights, which features this bar that I absolutely love. You don't even have to do too much. You can turn me on with just a touch. And the best vocal performance by Abel on this album. In Your Eyes is such a great bop, I, I just can't not dance when listening to this. Save Your Tears goes back to that 80s pop that, just like In Your Eyes, I can't not dance to. Repeat After Me is Ecotoxicity on this album, which then goes into the title track, which is absolutely haunting and then danceable. And then the album ends off with Until I Bleed, which is The Weeknd and his toxic form once again. God, how the fuck could Abel make toxicity sound so good? <laughs> I've been getting into synthwave and 80s pop lately. That, that shouldn't really be a surprise to you guys. I mean, for fuck's sake, my background music. So this was easily a great album for me to get into. And like I said, it's just constant bangers or vibes or both. Also, I noticed there's like an entirely separate story going on in the music videos, and they're not in order of the album. From my understanding after watching them, it goes Until I Bleed Out, Snow Child, Heartless, Blinding Lights, then Blinding Lights Jimmy Kimmel performance, After I Was Short Film, and then ends with In Your Eyes. If there's any other music videos that's been released uh, after me finding this out, and uh, they're not on here, and you think they belong on here, well, figure that out for yourself. I'm not, I'm not gonna bother with that. And once again, this whole story in the music videos doesn't represent the story the album tells, which I thought was actually really interesting and unique, and just added a second layer to this album that I that I also really love. This thing is just so goddamn good, and once again, thank you D'Angelo for indirectly helping me truly understand what I was once missing, because god damn am I am so glad I experienced it. <laughs> Can I have you done now? Yes, you can. Okay, so this is this is the last thing I need to do. Yes. There's no other list. Nope. Alright. You're not bullshitting me, are you? No, I'm not.
So I'm not just gonna magically appear with my third video of 2021 being another fucking year-end list. No, you won't. You did the wipe, but you won't now. You sure? Yeah, I'm fucking sure. Alright. Well, I guess I'll just uh, fall asleep for another 12 months. <laughs> you also had to talk about the album. There, 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 there. Fuck!